<laughs> Welcome to Life Story Church, everybody. This is the church that you are building one brick at a time. We're happy to see your smiling faces here this morning. A couple announcements to jump to you right off the bat. Uh, as we mention every week, uh, Facebook, Facebook, because we want you guys to take advantage of social media. I think there's even a, a Twitter accounts and whatnot as well. But Facebook is definitely the main tool that uh, seems to be used by the church body here. So take advantage of it. Check in at Life Story Church. Say how glad you are to be here. Invite your friends. Share the page. Write a review. Uh, all that good stuff. So uh, take a day, a full advantage of that, especially when we've got events going on. Uh, we're kind of reaching into the dog days of summer now, but uh, in the next couple months we're going to be having events again, so always take advantage of that. Also the website, please take advantage of the website, uh, livestorychurch.com. If you're going to be traveling, please take advantage of the online giving. I know most of you uh, already do that, and many of you uh, watching at home and to take advantage of that as well. So thank you for your faithfulness. Even though you're not with us, we uh, consider you a big part of what we're doing. So uh, take full advantage of that. Also on the website, you can always send people to that. You can share that on Facebook to let people know who we are, what we believe, what we're uh, hoping to build here in West Nashville. We're hoping to build in Bellevue. So with that, let's jump into our message today because I've got... <clears throat> Got a lot of ground to cover. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, fill your notebooks up this morning. If you're taking notes, if, if at any point your your pen uh, your pen gets tired and you'd like me just to email you the notes, I can email you the notes as well. All right. Uh, but uh, we've been in the sermon series, the first church, uh, for the last uh, four weeks. This is week four already. The first church. Uh, message number four, week four, Let's, that has gone by quickly. That has been uh, some, some deep waters. We're going to get into some deep waters again uh, this morning. Uh, I hope to draw a contrast with this sermon series. I wanted to do a study on the first church because really we are, as a church plant, uh, beginning from nothing, essentially, we have a chance to make this church whatever we want it to be. First and foremost, we want it to be what God wants it to be. We want it to be what the Holy Spirit is leading it to be. One thing's for sure, though, we know that the church is not a building. Okay. Right? The church is you guys. So, what did the first church look like? The first church. <clears throat> we spent the last few weeks discussing uh, what the church is, when it was really born, uh, some, last week we talked about some ancient uh, church followers from the first and second centuries. Um, you know, we want our church, Life Story Church, to look like the first church. I want to draw a clear contrast. I think so, simply by studying the first church, we see rather quickly the difference between the church today that we see around us in the world and the first church. Now, we don't want to be an apostate church, do we? Absolutely not, right? I think many in this room would agree that the church, by and large, has grown apostate. Apostate simply means abandoning your principles or religious convictions. Aban the church has, in, in large part, abandoned the principles found in the Word of God on many different issues. We don't want to be like that. I think that in the, the short study so far, we've seen a contrast between the first church and the church today, and it's given us a clear blueprint on how to move forward. So uh, we're going to continue in the sermon series because I think it's incredibly relevant, not just for the church at large today, but specifically this church, you guys, Life Story Church, you at home. So where we left off, let's begin there, shall we? Where we all left off last week, uh, we studied and understood that the ancient church fathers maintained two themes in their writings, okay? Well, you remember what we just, to, to back up a little bit, what we talked about last week, okay, was the, the apostles, okay, effectively, the apostles, uh, and then their apostles made up the first church. You know, we have the writings, the holy scriptures of uh, 
Paul's writings, Peter's writings, you know, we've got uh, the, the, the Gospels. But we, have, we have sacred writings of the Apostles, but the disciples of the Apostles, they have a lot of writings, a lot of writings that really confirm what the Holy Spirit is oftentimes, oftentimes trying to teach us through studying the Word of God. We have these other writings that are actually confirming that, that the church, by and large, never reads or looks at. I mean, have, have you ever, in your study of uh, a Pauline epistle or just your, your Bible study time at home, busted out the works of Arrhenius? Yeah? No. It's, it's not your fault. I haven't either. But there is a lot to be learned through those ancient church fathers' writings that confirm what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us through our study of the New Testament. Now, we looked at, we looked at some of those, just, I mean, we scratched the surface barely, but we looked at some of those uh, first century church fathers and looked at some of their writings last week. But as a whole, when you, when you continue to look through them, there, there is a dominant theme. There's actually two dominant themes throughout the writings. Number one is unity. Unity. Uh, we did this last week. Let's see who remembers. Just today in America, there are how many denominations? 158. <laughs> you're, you're close now. <laughs> there are 150, and that's, that's, a, that's a conservative estimate, all right? 158 uh, as a recent count, and that's, that goes back a couple years. So that's old data, 158, okay? How many different denominations, if you look at different doctrines, do you think that there should be, according to most scholars? Oh, five to seven. Five to seven, there's some debate as far as if we're really going to split and have different denominations, you know, what's a good enough reason to split, okay? The early church fathers uh, uh, taught of uh, primary and secondary issues. The church should never be split over a secondary issue. Now, it should only ever be split over a primary issue, and most scholars say there's only five, maybe seven reasons good enough to go ahead and have another denomination, all right? Yet in our country today, there are 158 different denominations, and that's a conservative number, as I mentioned. The church is splitting and splitting and splitting and splitting over secondary issues is the reason why. The ancient church fathers didn't want that. Throughout all of their writings, they, they struck the tone of unity, 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 unity. Okay? But how? How do we stay together? What will keep us united as the body of Christ? And that's the second theme throughout all of their uh, writings is Scripture as the ultimate authority. Scripture as the ultimate authority. They would always point back to the Scriptures, to the, to the, the letters of Paul and the Gospels, always pointing, uh, and Peter, always pointing back, uh, and John, always pointing back to the Word of God. And on any issue, they would say, well, this is what Paul says. This is what Peter says. This is what the Word of God says. This is what we were taught. I mean, we're talking about first century, uh, second century guys who, if they weren't taught directly by, by Peter, if they weren't taught directly by Paul, their, uh, their mentor was. So, I mean, very close. I mean, you, imagine, you can imagine that they've got it on pretty good authority, Right? And their mission, their mantra was always to point back to the Word of God. Doctrine. The Word of God. Your Bible. Generations, church, generations before you have bled to maintain its integrity. I think that I think that it hurts us that we, we aren't scholars of, of the fathers of the church. Because truly, I think we, a lot of times, some of us, we have this Bible, and it seems like there's this big gap, there's this big disconnect between me here with my Bible and 2,000 years ago when it was written. And then I wonder, you know, is it, 
you know, what's the integrity of this thing? Has it been changed over the generations? Well, it's, you can only guess if you, if you don't study, if you don't study uh, uh, its history. There is a history. The Word of God has been on a journey, and generation by generation, uh, our ancient church fathers have struggled, have led to maintain its integrity, and always point to the Word of God as the ultimate authority, thus the thing that will keep us in unity as the church. It's an easy, with that in mind, it's an, there is an easy self-examination question to present in light of the content uh, that I'm presenting this. What are you willing to do for the scriptures? Generations before us have bled to maintain its integrity. What are you willing to do for the scriptures? Are you willing to defend them? Are you willing to defend them? Are you willing to bleed for them? Sadly, in our culture today, it's a daunting task to simply ask the believer to read them. Well, let alone defend or bleed. And that is why Satan has so many people that we love. So many people that we love in bondage, church. That's the reason. There are 27 books in the New Testament, but only seven of them are specifically addressed to churches. Only seven are specifically addressed to churches. And they truly, truly were the first churches. If we are going to have a conversation about what church should look like, we cannot have it without studying these seven churches. Paul wrote letters to his friends. He wrote letters to Timothy. Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, most believe. But to churches, he wrote only wrote set to seven. Some of them more than once. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, follow-up letters. Even letters uh, uh, that uh, are, are lost, Corinthian letters that are believed to be lost. He wrote to them multiple times, but he specifically only wrote to seven churches. I see that. Let's look at this map quickly. Let me show you a map. Again, if you'd like to grab this email to you. I want you to just wrap your head on. Paint a picture for you this morning. Here's Nazareth. Here's Jerusalem. We're looking at the Mediterranean Sea. We're looking at Asia Minor, that's modern-day Turkey. We're looking at Greece. We're looking at Italy. This was the land where the first church initially exploded. And these are the churches that Paul wrote letter after letter to. Only these seven, though. Why these seven? Why, why only seven and why these seven? One day I'm going to ask him that question. <laughs> but I do find it interesting that in Revelation, when John receives his revelation, Jesus asks him to give a message to, does anybody know how many churches? Seven, seven. seven churches again. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 through 8, reads, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. I, I could just preach on that right now. Grace to you. Grace to you. Mm. From him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Five, and from, excuse me, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Somebody say amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, 
Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. The spirits of the seven churches. Now, can I see that next graphic above? That next picture right here. Here we see the, the, church, the seven churches, their name. The seven churches are named uh, in Revelation. As we continue reading, it's a wonderful study, the first three chapters of uh, a Revelation. And in this study, we will get there. Okay, Not this morning, but we will get there. So here we see seven churches. Again, it seems significant, seems to correlate, but then there are different churches, different church cities, different church uh, names, right? But in, in the case of each church in Revelation, it's important to note that there is a corresponding spirit, a corresponding spirit that sees over each church before his throne, seeing over each church. Let's keep reading. Revelation, uh, let's see. Okay, never mind. Never mind. We just read that. I read too far. Okay, so each church in verse, can I see uh, verse 4, actually? Verse 4, the seven spirits which are before his throne. Some have interpreted spirit in this verse as meaning pastor. Okay? Chuck, Dr. Chuck Missler uh, offers conjecture that that could possibly be what it means, but considering the New, Te uh, the New Testament context, church, considering that Paul wrote to, church, to, to the churches and he specifically only wrote to seven, I'm not so convinced that angel in this scripture doesn't actually, or spirit in this uh, uh, passage doesn't actually mean angel. Seven specific spirits, seven specific angels that sit over the church's period, seven spirits. And we've already talked earlier that there should, uh, theologians like Dr. Ken Johnson and other scholars believe that if there is going to be a split of doctrine, at most it would be five to seven. seven. At most, seven churches that Paul wrote to, seven churches that Jesus sent letters to. Interesting. Is there an angel watching over the life story of church? Specifically? Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. Uh, I'll offer you this on that line of thinking. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. This is a famous prophetic passage here. And the Spirit of the Lord, translated there, the Spirit of the Lord, is Ruach HaKadosh. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, the third person of, the, of God, the Holy Spirit shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel or advice, and might, strength, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of fear or reverence. So let me count that again. Prophesying about the Messiah who is to come shall be the the, the roots of, uh, of uh, Jesse. Seven spirits shall rest on David. Seven spirits shall rest on Messiah. What are the seven spirits? The Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, spirit of knowledge, and a spirit of fear or perspective or reverence. Seven spirits again. So we've got seven spirits before the throne, seven spirits that represent each church in Revelation. We've got Paul writing only seven letters to uh, the churches, and seven spirits shall rest on David, shall rest on Messiah. Interesting. Interesting. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes neither reprove 
after hearing of his ears. There is a pattern of seven spirits. They rest upon the Lord, they rest upon David, they rest upon the seven churches of Revelation. There are seven letters from Paul to the churches. You decide. You decide. Can I see uh, Paul's letters? Actually, list of them. Here we have a list of those seven letters. I mentioned earlier we can't have a study about the first church. Try and figure out how we want to model ourselves as a church without studying these seven churches. Well, here they are in chronological order as they were written. This is not the order that they're in in your Bible. You'll find Romans comes first, so on and so forth, right? But this is the order that Paul wrote these letters to seven different churches. 52 AD, he wrote 1 Thessalonians. Uh, 53 AD, 2 Thessalonians. 57 AD, 1 Corinthians. This is what he wrote. Uh, you'll notice on, on the chart here, he wrote 1 Thessalonians while he was in Corinth. He's in Corinth, at that church, writing to another church. You'll notice when he was in Ephesus, he wrote to the Corinthians. When he was in Macedonia, he wrote 2 Corinthians. When he was back in Corinth again, he wrote to the Galatians, wrote to the Romans. And now when he was in Rome, he wrote to the Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. You see the order in which he wrote to them. I think that that's significant to pay attention to you, church. You know, I'll get to why here in a moment. But what does Paul have to say to these seven churches? What does Jesus have to say to those seven churches? Let's start with Paul. Of these churches, of these churches, we have a purpose for each letter. If you're taking notes, I don't think that I've got a chart on this one, guys. Do I? No, I did wonderful. That's what I'm looking for. Thanks, God. You can see why he wrote each letter. He wrote to the Romans. It's all about doctrine. It's all about grace. It's all about salvation. In first and second, second Corinthians, it's a reproof. In other words, he's addressing their behavior. In Galatians, he's correcting them, correcting them on their doctrine and their behavior. Doctrine primarily. Correction them. Of it. When he wrote to the Ephesians, again, he was establishing church doctrine, the doctrine of the church in Ephesians. The Philippians uh, letter, Paul's letter of great joy, it's a reproof. He's addressing their behavior. The letter of, to the Colossians, again, is a correction. First and uh, second Thessalonians is primarily doctrine. So each letter has its specific Purpose. It's very reminiscent of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, which he writes, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. There it is. That's why you can look at each letter and correlate it back to 2 Timothy, what the intent of each letter is for. So, pretty much all we need to know as a church wanting to uh, uncover what kind of church the Lord wants us to be, what kind of church that Paul wants us to be. So I want to take, I want to take a look at these letters, these seven letters, and I want to do it in order. Can I see that chronological order again, Andrew? Okay, right there. I want to do it in order. So, the church in Thessalonica is where we're going to start. I want to take a look at each segment of these churches. Now, look, we're going to graze over the top. I could literally do a sermon series on each one of them, okay? But I'm just going to take one day and graze over them to, to fit them into the context of what we're talking about, okay? Today, I want to take a look at Thessalonica. Ch the church in Thessalonica was afraid that the end of the world was at hand. They were afraid that the end of the world was at hand. And that was why they were suffering. They were suffering persecution. They were afraid that they perhaps were in the tribulation. Okay? Paul's response in an effort to give them hope was to remind them 
of what he had taught them while he was with them. It's estimated that Paul was only there, uh, there with them for three weeks. While he was there, he established a strong doctrine with them. Remember, the Thessalonian letters are doctrine letters. They establish a doctrine. Okay? He wanted to give them some hope by reminding them of what he had taught them in the short time he was there with them. What did he teach them? End time prophecy. It's the whole focus of his letters. He points them to prophecy to encourage them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 17. He reminds them of this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the arch archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That word, caught up right there. If you're taking notes, underline it. Can I see that uh, passage, Bob? If you see, yeah, there it is, thank you. Caught up. In verse 17, it's this word in the Greek. It means, it's the Greek word harpazo. It means forcibly snatched up. The Latin translation of it is rapturum. If you've ever gotten into a, a, a conversation with somebody about the rapture and Jesus coming in the clouds and we're going to meet him there and oh, Lord, I, just, I wish the Lord would come back and get us and, God, and so on and so forth and you have a doubter among you and they might say, well, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. It is. It is. It's in the Vulgate, Raptura. Okay, that's where the, the word rapture comes from. There are a couple keys here in this passage, okay? Don't let anybody ever tell you that the, the Bible doesn't say rapture. And two, what did the Lord descend with? A shout, a voice, a trump. We'll come back, we'll come back to this, okay? We'll come back to this. Paul continues then to encourage them with end times teaching in 2 Thessalonians. Okay. First they're discouraged, they're afraid, he encouraged them and said, hey, you know, no, no, don't worry, don't worry, remember what I taught you. The Lord will come in the air, there'll be a shout, a trump, remember, don't be discouraged. Okay. Paul then continues to teach them uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as if it's from us. Apparently a false letter had come to them by somebody claiming to be Paul. He's saying, that Don't let a false letter shake you, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be re revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is good. Okay, so a couple things. A couple things here. The Thessalonians were worried that they were in the tribulation because of the persecution that they were suffering. Paul writes a letter to encourage them, and they relax. They tell him that he's going to come in the clouds. Let me remind you of this. So they, uh, they, they, they're so comforted that they abruptly, immediately quit their jobs and lay back. And <laughs> due, to, due to that, due to their... Decided just to sit back and wait for Jesus. He's coming anytime now. All right. We, we didn't miss it. We were afraid we missed the rapture. We didn't miss the rapture. Okay? He's coming. So they quit their jobs and they're just waiting on him to come and they begin to become persecuted even more so. So now they really think that they're, they're, they're in the middle of it. So Paul writes in this other letter to clarify even more. Paul uses the word beseech in his opening line here. This is a very strong word in the Greek, and it means to earnestly beg. 
or to implore. It is an extreme use of the word beg. So what is Paul earnestly begging of the believers in Thessalonica? Paul is earnestly beseeching them, begging them not to be upset or worried that the day of wrath had begun. He said they were not to be troubled by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from anyone, that this day of Christ had begun. He continues uh, in, in uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first, comma, and that the man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of There's some confusion on this uh, scripture because in the old King James there wasn't a comma. <laughs> and so people thought it was one event, the, the man of perdition and the falling away all at once. Paul is telling us not to allow ourselves to be tricked by any man into believing that the day of wrath has begun, for it cannot start until after a falling away happens. He's encouraging them with this end time prophecy. Would anybody in here say that there has been a falling away in the church? I would. I would. What does it look like, though? What does the great falling away that he's talking of really look like? I mean, you can argue that there has been a falling away since the church first started. We've been on a downward trend. You can look at different periods of history. You can look at the Dark Ages for The Greek for falling away in this passage is the word apostasy. Mm -hmm. Apostasy is what it is. Okay? This word has been transliterated into the English as apostasy, which means an abandonment of one's religious faith. Thus, the vast majority of biblical teachers and students believe that in these last days, Christians, <clears throat> believers, will turn away from God and the truths of the Bible and fall by the wayside. Almost every evangelical teacher traditionally believes that there will be a falling away from God in the end times. And you can read this in books and on websites everywhere. This one verse, all by itself, has birthed a mid trib rapture theory. But this is not the original meaning of the word apostasy. In Greek literature, firstly, in the, in the original Greek text, it reads the falling away, not a falling away. Okay? The falling away, not a, as it does in the, in the King James Version. This is a crucial difference, church, and here's why. This marks out the falling away as an event. The falling away is a specific event. Apostasia is made up of two words, apo and stasia. In Appendix 104 of the Companion Bible, E. W. Bullinger defines it as such. The meaning, the meaning of apostasia. The word is a Greek compound of apo or from, and istemi or stand. Thus, it has the core meaning of away from or departure. Departure. Liddell and Scott's a Greek-English lexicon defines apostasia first as defection or revolt, and then secondly as, again, departure or disappearance. The original meaning of this word, which is agreed by many Greek scholars, familiar with the ancient text, is the departure or the disappearance. Do not be troubled. Do not think that you're in the end times. Do not think that you've been left behind. Remember what I taught you, Paul is telling them. The departure must come first. The disappearance must come first. Actually, in the Geneva Bible, in 1560, what happened? The Geneva Bible in 1560, the Kramer Bible published in 1537, the Tyndale Bible published in 1539, all preceding the King James Version, all translate this verse, before the day of the Lord comes, 
there must come a departure first or disappearance. Before the day of the Lord begins, church, there must first be a departure of born-again believers from this world to be with Christ. Paul Tan, a lesser-known scholar, did an extensive study on the phrase, falling away, and he had this to say. What precisely does Paul mean when he says that the falling away must happen before the tribulation? The definite article, the, denotes that this is a definite event, an event distinct from the appearance of the man of sin. The, word, the Greek word for the falling away, taken by itself, does not mean apostasy or defection. Neither does it mean to fall, as the Greeks have another word for that, picto, I fall. The best translation of the word is to depart. The Apostle Paul here refers to a definite event which he calls the departure, which will occur just before the start of the tribulation. This departure is the gathering together of the church, otherwise called by some the rapture of the church. First and second Thessalonians is a letter of doctrine, end time doctrine. Remember the context of this whole chapter. The coming of the Lord Jesus, our gathering together unto him. This is why Paul says in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words that I'm giving you. There is no comfort in telling Christians that they are going to suffer the horrible torture and persecution of the great tribulation church. Paul taught a pre-tribulation rapture, and that's the doctrine that, that we find in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. It's also the doctrine that is supported by overwhelming, an overwhelming number of texts of the ancient church fathers. Some try to say that this is a new idea, this idea of a rapture of pre-tribulation. was birthed in the 1850s, but it just isn't so. Speaking of those uh, ancient church fathers, <coughs> that is a little. Pre-tribulation eschatology is not a new idea. Pre-tribulation eschatology was outlined in the Episcopal of Barnabas, which is dated to A.D. 100. It was uh, outlined by Arrhenius in his great work against heresies. Hippolytus, who was a disciple of Arrhenius, also taught pre-trib rapture. Justin Martyr, in his work Dialogue with Trifo, taught a pre-tribulation rapture. Ephraim, the Syrian in the 4th century, Ephraim of Nicebus in AD 306 wrote this. He had a sermon. It was titled, On the Last Times, the Antichrist and the End of the World. That's a sermon I'd like to hear. He wrote this. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come. There are taken to... They, and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. Jesus' church is coming in the clouds, and we will meet him there. That is the doctrine of the church. That is the doctrine of First and Second Thessalonians. The truth is reiterated in First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. And again, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive, receive salvation through our Lord, Jesus Christ the church. There is a reason for hope. The deceiving spirits that were operating to terrify Christians in Thessalonica are working in the world still today. They're working hard in the church today. They're trying to divide us on doctrines. They're trying to divide us. Now you can look, look at eschatology. You look at us. There, there are so many different church denominations just based on eschatology. Don't listen to fear, church. Don't listen to fear. Luke chapter 21 Verse 28 tells us, Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your hands, because your redemption.
redemption draws near. Look up and see what Jesus had wished the Pharisees, blinded by tradition, would have seen in Moedim. The signs in the heavens. The divine appointments set by the signs in the heavens. So, that's a lot. Next week, we're going to look at the next chapter. I want to go through, I want to gain an overview of these seven churches as we're establishing, establishing uh, what kind of church we're going to be as we're defining it. The first church. What did it look like? The first church? The first church was a uh, pre-tribulation theology church. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. I mean, you can, you can, I love Chuck Mister says, you know, if you torture the data long enough, it'll, can, it'll uh, uh, confess to anything. Right? So you can pull scriptures out of context and twist them around and wrap them around your theology, or you can look at the full context of the Word of God, and you'll find that it's plain as day. The disciples of the apostles taught pre trib rapture. Paul defines, has written these two letters in, in, uh, to the Thessalonians, defining the, the, the end time uh, doctrine of the first church, right here. So, with that, I've, I'm going to transition here, I'm going to pivot. Speaking to that point of fear, that spirit of fear that's out there in the world, uh, there's a lot happening. <laughs> there's a lot happening this week, isn't there? Uh, um, I hope that Paul's words Encourage you in the light, in the light of everything that we see happening in our church. God has not abandoned us. Our country, our leadership, seem to certainly have abandoned God, but God has not abandoned us. Okay? There's some deep waters, I know, some deep doctrine studying a, a letter of doctrine. But I hope that it encourages you. Let's see what we've got here this morning. A rabbi, a rabbi in Israel, has come out and declared that the final redemption is at the door. Remember last year, rabbi after rabbi after rabbi mm -hmm. kept coming out. And well, literally, we're up to like seven or eight different rabbis who were predicting that the end is near, the end is near, uh, calling for all the Jews to make Aliyah back to Israel to fulfill end time prophecy. Uh, Messiah is coming soon, Messiah is coming soon. Well, here's another one. Uh, has spoken of this week, a prominent rabbi in Israel said, it is declared uh, uh, the final redemption is at the door. Let me see the next one that's related to this, actually. No, there's, there's one more that's related. Okay, and another rabbi, this week again, in Israel, has come out and said, thousands hit by an extreme global flooding, lightning, and tornadoes. What does it mean? Well, is there another rabbi has come out and said it means we're in the end times and that the Messiah is soon to come. So again, we're seeing a trend of escalating uh, predictions by rabbis in Israel. Let me see what else we've got. Okay. This was big, uh, incredible. Have you guys seen the news? Uh, England has left uh, the European Union. They've made a decision to put Britain first, essentially. Putting Britain first. It's a common thing that we're hearing in the world today, isn't it? Uh, this is incredible. This is the, the stock market took a plunge, had some folks nervous, but truly I believe that this is a victory for us, church. Uh, it's prophesied that in the end times, Revelation teaches us that there will be a one world government, there will be a one world uh, monetary system, uh, a one world order, essentially, right? Well, it used to be, it used to be that people that held those beliefs and were were working and scheming to make that happen. It was kind of under the radar. Every once in a while, you, you'd see a, a prominent a politician or somebody say something and mention the New World Order and whatnot, and, and people who were studiers of end time prophecy and you know look for different things online and play the video and you'd be like, oh my gosh, he actually said it. 
Now that we've got the President of the United States talking about the One World Order, the new global initiative, the new, the new global uh, world order, so on. So you hear it's constantly. There are, uh, uh, this is a big blow. This is a big blow to the globalists because effectively England is stepping back from the globalist agenda of making us a one world government that bows to the UN. England is stepping back and saying, no, we're going to take our money, we're going to have our own kind, we're going to be an independent nation, we're going to be the United Kingdom again. And it's inspiring uh, uh, Scotland uh, uh, as well to think about doing the same thing. So uh, the more independent the nations can be, the less globalized we are the more prosperous England can now be, England who is paying $20 billion a year into the European Union, only receiving $10 billion back and having their law dictated to them from the European Union is now independent, thank goodness. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think that it's directly related to the immigration problem. The immigration influx agenda that's being pushed, uh, it was certainly pushed on England, uh, for the last several years now, the number one name for newborn baby boys in London has been Mohammed. That's where that's where their immigration uh, uh, policies have gotten them, and thus we see uh, the terrorist activities in England and Paris, the, all of the European Union's uh, agenda playing out in Europe. So England, uh, good for them for taking their country back. We will be doing the same thing soon, hopefully, uh, not really. Alan Greenspan on this headline says the British break from the EU is just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the tip of the iceberg. It will have a ripple effect with other nations possibly doing the same thing. I say hopefully doing the same thing. It will certainly uh, be a blow to stock markets, but in the long run, I think good for those involved. What else do we have? We, we talked about this at Bible study a little bit. There's an awful shooting uh, in Orlando uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the Department of Justice released the transcripts of the shooter's 911 call. When he called in and they heard him yelling, Allah, Allah, Allah is the, uh, the greatest. I'm doing this uh, for ISIS, pledging allegiance, so on and so forth. They released the transcripts, and in the transcript they scrubbed Every place where he said Allah, they wrote God instead of Allah, which there was, thankfully, we, we uh, are still in a place as a nation where there was outrage over uh, the incredible audacity of the administration to be so uh, misleading. So keep an eye on this. Keep an eye on uh, uh, the faith that England is suffering and is trying to now recover from by making this move. We need to be paying attention as Christians so that we don't fall, uh, fall victim to it as well because if Christians in this country don't know what's going on enough to stand up against uh, the wicked plans of man, then who will, right? So we have to be aware of these things. What else do we have? Is that it? All right, church, we'll, we'll close here today, okay? Well, close. every eye closed and every head bowed. You know, uh, I just leave it to the Holy Spirit to do a work in your heart. I don't know if there's uh, uh, anything that we just studied this morning that's touched your heart or inspired you in any way to uh, Lean into the Word of God, to trust the Word of God, to I don't want to inspire you or encourage you, whatever it is. I just want to, I want to give you a moment to lay, to lay whatever it is on your heart at the foot of the cross this morning. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, God, we as your people, Father, ask that you would continue to open our minds, Father. Continue to impart wisdom to us. Continue to give us knowledge, Father, that we need to navigate this world, Father. To defend the Word of God, Father. To 
strive for unity, Father, to meet you in your word, Lord. Lord, we want all that you have for us. And we just ask that you administer to the hearts of your people this morning. Meet them where they are. Right now in this room, every eye closed, every head bowed. In light of, in light of the events of the day, in light of in light of this, the serious nature of our study this morning, if there's anybody here that feels like there's something uh, off in their lives, something off in their hearts, if the Spirit is bringing conviction on any specific issue, I want you to lay it in front of the cross right now this morning. If there's anybody here, nobody's looking around, just raise your hand and put it right back down. You put it right back down. Thank you. If there's anybody here that wants to say a prayer of recommitment, if anybody wants to give their heart to Jesus Christ for maybe the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time, you need to say a prayer of grief. You know, if there's anybody here this morning, raise your hand. You can put it right back down. You can put it right back down. Thank you. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, God, Jesus, Yeshua, I believe that you love me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Say this prayer with me. I believe that you love me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I believe that you live. I believe you rose. I believe that because you have life, I have life, and I want that life, God. I surrender my heart. I surrender, sur surrender what I want, uh, what I need, and I want what you want and what you need for my life, God. I lay it down for Come into my heart and make me new. Walk with me, God. Teach me. Take me deeper, Father. Deeper into you. Deeper into your word. I want to go deeper. That's my heart's prayer. My heart's desire. Walk with me all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen, Amen church. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he pour his favor out on your life. May you walk in understanding and in knowledge and prosper in all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. <laughs>